Hey there, and welcome to The Gathering YouTube. My name's Maddie, and I'm our online pastor. If this is your first time checking out our channel, welcome. Be sure to head over and click that subscribe button. Messages like the one you're about to watch premiere here every Sunday at 10 a.m. alongside a whole bunch of additional content. Or if you've been hopping around our channel for a while, maybe you've checked out some other videos, I wanna invite you to fill out a connect card that lets me know that you're here and gives me the opportunity to reach out and say hello. With that, enjoy the message. Hey everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today in worship. My name is Maddie, I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm so excited to spend a little time together. We're in week two of our series, No Regrets, and if you are anything like me, you have had to actively resist calling this series No Regrets over the last couple of weeks, because you saw We Are the Millers one time in like the last five years, and this is the only thing you see every time you talk about the series, No Regrets. All jokes aside, I think that this series really is important. God doesn't want us to be burdened down by regret. And so we're talking about what it looks like to set that aside and to move forward into a more purposeful and free future. Last week, Pastor Charity kicked us off by introducing what I consider to be like step one in this process of setting aside our regrets, which is learning to recognize our mistakes, our wrong choices, and our harmful moments. But it's not just about recognizing our mistakes. Really, it's allowing our mistakes to be our teachers. Our mistakes give us a chance to rethink our choices. They help us to learn and to grow into a better future. In church, we call this process of rethinking repentance. And each of us, depending on our faith background, might have a different understanding of what that word repentance means. Hearing that, some of us might begin to immediately slip into these memories kind of laced with shame. You were taught that part of repentance was accepting the shame that others place on you for your choices. Or maybe you're kind of the opposite. You hear this word and you immediately assume that repentance is synonymous with apology. That saying you're sorry was repenting, that that was all that it took. But repentance really isn't either of those things. It's not intended to bring us feelings of shame, and it is a little deeper than just saying we're sorry. Repenting is an action. It's a verb. It's an invitation that we receive to rethink our choices and to actively turn away from what we regret and turn toward God. When we rethink our decisions and we actively turn away from our mistakes and past behaviors, we're choosing to turn toward a future more aligned with who God calls us to be. But you know, this process isn't easy. In fact, rethinking our choices can be really difficult. I mean, who wants to set aside the time to begin to dive deep into their patterns of behavior and to begin uncovering and unpacking these stories that we've learned that might influence the way that we move in the world. Like, that just sounds like the last possible thing I want to do with all of my free time. But unfortunately, like, the reality of regret is that it never leaves us. And we can tuck it away and we can do our best to ignore it, but eventually it's going to creep back up. I can give you an example from my own life. So when I was in college, one of my best friends started dating this guy. And as you might have guessed, I was not his biggest fan. And I was pretty uh, vocal about the fact that I wasn't his biggest fan. I was not very kind or compassionate toward him. And eventually when they broke up, If I'm honest, I really didn't think anything of my behavior. I kind of just brushed it off and we moved on. But a few years later, he ended up moving into the city and became really close with one of my other good friends. And we started hanging out more often and I realized pretty quickly that I had completely misjudged him. He was actually a very kind and generous and funny person and I had completely written him off. And I started to feel some regret about the way that I had treated him when we were in college. And instead of really addressing those things and and apologizing for my behavior or maybe even changing how I chose to move in the future, I decided I wasn't even going to open that can of worms. So I just tucked that regret far, far away because I knew that the moment I started unpacking that, there was going to be a lesson there for me to learn about some behaviors that I was holding on to. 
And so instead, I just ran through all my classic regret avoidant tricks, like doom scrolling on social media, binge watching a Netflix show, reading a book so elaborate I couldn't really think of anything else. But it wasn't enough to shake the feeling that I was carrying. And so eventually, we sat down and had a conversation where I was able to apologize. And through that, we were able to form this really lovely friendship. I even got to participate in his wedding a few weeks ago, which is just this beautiful full circle moment for me. And that kind of friendship and healing and relationship would have never been possible had I not addressed my regret and chose to be the kind of person who apologized when she was wrong. What felt like this scary burden that I had to navigate with him in my life ended up being this really beautiful gift of healing. Our ability to rethink our actions and move toward a better future is such a gift from God. It is an invitation every single time for us to hope and to dream and to grow. We're invited to envision this person that God is calling us to become and to rethink every day how our actions turn and point us in that direction. This process of rethinking our regrets, it can feel pretty overwhelming, especially if we believe that we're in it alone. When it was just me and my feelings, I felt really compelled to sink into them, to let that regret consume me every time he and I were in the room together. It was a burden. But when I started paying a little more attention, I recognized that those moments were really just these little holy nudges that were pushing me and reminding me that I was still deeply loved by God, I was still chosen by God, but that I was called to turn to something more. Jesus is there with us when we rethink our choices, and I think that he offers us three guides, three points of connection or touch points that can help turn us back toward him when regrets rise up. Jesus asks us compassionate and curious questions. Jesus casts a vision for the person that we're becoming, and Jesus gives us hope for a better future. Last Sunday, Pastor Charity told the story of the Apostle Peter. He was one of the disciples of Jesus, and before Jesus was arrested, he told Peter that he was going to publicly deny him three times. Now, Peter swore up and down that he was not going to do that. That wasn't who he was. That wasn't in alignment with his character. But like Jesus says, Peter does deny him. And the third time he does it, he looks up and he kind of, he locks eyes with Jesus. And I can just imagine the feelings he has in that moment, the moment that he realizes what he's done. Because I've felt it before when I realized my mistake with my friend. I'd imagine that his his stomach, it like kind of bottomed out that he immediately felt remorse and regret for what he had done, that he wished he could take it back, but he couldn't. Maybe that was a feeling that you've had in the past, that moment, that kind of stomach sinking feeling. And Peter's story, it doesn't just stop there. You know, he's still a disciple. He's still in the room with his friends as they grieve the loss of their mentor and as they try to figure out how to move forward. And this is where I think Peter's experience is so relatable. It's something we can connect to also. Because regret, it likes to tell us these stories about who we are and what we're worth. For example, like maybe you messed up at work, but you're still invited into those important meetings. And now you just, you kind of feel out of place because regret tells you that you're no longer deserving of being in the room Or maybe, you know, you made a mistake with someone in your family and now you feel really disconnected from your loved ones even though you're all sitting at the same table. Or maybe, you know, you made a choice and it impacted a friendship, but you're still in the group chat. Now you're not really sure how to navigate conversations with your friends. Regret does this. It has this way of turning us inward to ourselves, kind of spinning these narratives about our worth that can isolate us from ourselves and those we love and from God. And I think that that's what Peter's battling in this moment. I'd imagine he's struggling 
with this balance of this call that he received from Jesus, this purpose placed in his life, paired with the regret that's laying heavy on his mind for the choices that he's made. Maybe that's an experience you can relate to. Maybe that's something you're familiar with. It's in that headspace that he decides, you know what, I just need a break. I'm gonna go take a step back into old patterns and behaviors and I'm gonna go fishing. And so he gets out on the water and it's there in that moment that Jesus shows up on the shore and invites him over to the beach. This is how their conversation goes. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Then feed my lambs, he told him. A second time, he asked Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Then shepherd my sheep, he told him. He asked him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved that he had asked him this the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. The first guide that Jesus offers us as we rethink our past mistakes is that of compassionate and curious questions. When Jesus interacts with Peter here, we see him break out one of his favorite teaching tactics, which is compassionate and curious questions. And Jesus does this a lot in the New Testament. Rather than just tell us the thing that we're supposed to learn, he has a habit of asking questions that equip us to be reflective, that help us to dig a little deeper to find the answers on our own. And that's what we see here. I mean, he almost has this like rhythmic, repetitive nature in his questioning of Peter. Over and over he asks him, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And while Peter, in his state of emotion and and regret, might interpret that line of questioning through that lens, I think Jesus is really offering up these questions as a compassionate lifeline You know, instead of feeding into the self-destructive narratives that regret can spin within us, Jesus offers us this still, small, constant, compassionate voice and question to turn us out of ourselves and draw our attention back toward him. Do you love me? And I love this question. I love the way that Jesus uses it here. Its consistency serves almost like an affirmation Over and over again, we're invited to remember that yes, we do love you. And yes, that is enough. It's a phrase I think we can easily modify in moments of high emotion into a breath prayer for those feelings in times when regret gets too loud and we need to just pause and center ourselves. We can inhale and think to ourselves, do you love me? And exhale the affirmation. Yes, Lord. Let's try it. Let's try it together. So get into kind of a comfortable position. You can lay your hands palms down or palms up on your lap. Close your eyes if that feels comfortable to you. Just kind of whisper these phrases to yourself or think them in your mind. But let's inhale together. Do you love me? And exhale. Yes, Lord. Let's do it one more time. Inhale. Do you love me? Yes, Lord. This simple prayer practice is one that we can use to create a little space within ourselves. We can put some distance between us and the regret that we're feeling. And once we've made some room, then we can get curious about our mistakes. We can reflect on our choices. We can ask ourselves compassionate questions like, what might have led me to make that decision? Is there a story or a narrative that I've been told that motivates my behaviors? How can I make a better choice in the future? Compassionate, curious questions allow us to unpack our mistakes so that we can find the lessons within them. This isn't like an instant process. It doesn't happen overnight, but we're not alone in it. 
Jesus is present with us as we go, prompting us to turn our eyes his way, reminding us that we're still chosen and that we're still wholly loved. The second guide I think Jesus offers us in this process of rethinking our past mistakes is a vision for the person that we're becoming. If we look at Jesus' pattern here in this story, what we notice is that he follows up all of his questions to Peter with a call to action. Feed my lambs, shepherd my sheep, feed my sheep. But he never tells Peter how to do those things. I think a false narrative that regret can weave within us is this notion that because of our mistakes, we'll never amount to more. That who we are today is who we'll be forever because we messed up. We might have an idea of who we want to become, but we don't even know how to start the process of getting there. When Jesus calls Peter to the work of caring for his sheep, he's inviting Peter and giving Peter the permission to remember what he was called to and to envision a better future for himself. He's calling Peter to something more and he's inviting him to rethink his choices so that he can become that person. This call we see with Peter is something that Jesus offers every single one of us to. Every single person watching with us, every single person in the room is called to love God and love neighbor. We're called to be a person who is salt and light, who spreads love and compassion and generosity in the world. And we're all uniquely gifted to reach that goal. That's why there's no like three point plan for how to love your neighbor because we're all gonna do it a little differently. But the call to become a person who loves our neighbor deeply, that is universal. For all of us, that is the same. And knowing that, we can reflect on our regrets and determine how a person who's called to love might make a different choice. When we feel that tension of regret in the vision of who God calls us to be, that tension can actually be a guide that turns our focus back to God. It can help us to rethink our entire mindset Suddenly, our inner monologue can go from something like, I'm so terrible because I snapped at them and my anger got the best of me, to my anger got the best of me in that moment, but I'm called to something more. So next time, I'm going to take more pauses so I can self-regulate before I get too angry. Or, you know, maybe it goes from, you know, I cut corners on that project and I really messed up and I just don't even deserve this role to, I cut corners on that project because I waited too long to start. And I know that I can do better. So next time, I'm going to make a better plan so I can stick to my timeline and get things done properly. When we have a vision for who we're becoming, we can shift the narrative of regret and think of a better way forward. Our mistakes have something to teach us. They reveal growing edges and spaces where God might want to challenge us. The beauty of this is that perfection is not the goal of repentance. Perfection is not the goal of repentance. Growth and change is. So when we're curious about our mistakes, when we show ourselves compassion, when we rethink our decisions in light of the person we're becoming, we can set down our regret and cling to the hope of a better future. And I think that that's the third guide Jesus gives us. Jesus offers us the hope of a better future. In that moment on the shore, that's what Jesus offers Peter. He offers him hope. He helps him imagine a version of himself where he makes different choices. He gives him permission to dream up a space where he might be able to right his mistakes. And that experience is not isolated to Peter. Every day, Jesus invites us to these hypothetical shores in our lives, and he's not there to fuel those inner narratives with regret and with guilt and with shame. Really, he wants to sit with us. He wants to make sure we've, you know, got a good snack because even Jesus knows that a good snack makes everything so much better. And he helps us to navigate the process of rethinking our mistakes. Jesus offers us hope in knowing that who we are today is not 
who we have to be tomorrow. There's hope in knowing that the goal of repentance is not perfection, it's action-oriented change. And there's hope in knowing that every single one of us in every phase and season of our lives can and is invited to rethink our choices to become more aligned with Jesus. Jesus invites everyone. Jesus invites you to sit with him on the shore. But he challenges you to rethink your choices so that you leave differently than when you came. That's the thing. It's turning away from who we were and turning toward Jesus. So I invite you today to consider how these guides show up in your life. Consider moments of reflection. Get curious about them. See what rises to the surface. Spend some time dreaming and envisioning the person that you want to become and then think about your choices through that lens. What would that person do in this moment to be more loving? And in all things, cling to the hope that there is nothing that you could ever do to remove God's love for you. You are still chosen. You are still worthy. You are still loved. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this gift that you give us in the process of repentance. We thank you that we have the opportunity to not be held back by the choices that we've made, but that you offer us chances to rethink our decisions so that we can become someone who looks a little more like you in the world. We thank you that you trust us with this opportunity to love others, and we know that we fall short of that a lot. And a lot of us are carrying things Um, that weigh us down, that burden us down from those moments where we might fall short from the vision you've casted of the person that we're becoming. So God, I pray that you would continue to repeat with that still small voice that seems to overpower all of the other stories in our head and remind us that we are loved, that loving you is enough, and that we always have the opportunity to turn towards something greater. Amen. Thanks for checking out our message. Before you go, be sure to head over to our channel and click the subscribe button. And if you liked the video, feel free to share it with a friend, invite them to come and watch with you. If you have been checking out our channel for a little while, I also wanna invite you to fill out a connect card. I would love the chance to reach out and say hello. Now, every time we gather together, either in person or online, we celebrate in a moment of generosity as a church. We believe that when we're generous with what we have, we both leave ourselves open to what God wants to do in our life, and we get to participate in what God is doing in the lives of others. If you're interested in learning more about our church and the way we support our community and beyond it, you could head to our description and check out our website. The ways to give are gonna be up on the screen as well as a link in our description, and I wanna invite you to participate in that now. And friends, with that, that's the message. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're interested in listening and singing along to the Gathering Worship team, you can find those videos as well as a virtual communion experience on our channel's homepage. Until next time, go in peace.